Welcome to the Genealogy Radio Show, the radio show that's keeping you in the loop. And this week's show is about a number of things. It's about Donegal and it's about the Mulhearns and it's about other Donegal surnames. But it's also about the path that people take to get Irish citizenship and all, all those kind of things that are related to family history and genealogy. Because it is very complex and some people have to go to a lot of bother to make sure that they can prove their roots or that their grandparents are born in Ireland and so on. And there's the foreign birth register and so on. So I feel that today's show has to be about that and also about the purpose of family reunions, because we're going to have a Mulhern family reunion on the 24th of May above in Harkins in Donegal, in Brona, and a lot of people with surnames of MacDade, MacGrotes, Campbells, so on, will be very interested in saying. Now, Donegal is a fascinating county. It has been said to me that you could enter Donegal and still drive 100 miles and not be at the end of it. And that's very significant. Its surnames were derived from a time in early times when the population of Ireland was a lot smaller than what it was today. Each person would have had a designated name, perhaps sometimes um, on a characteristic and so on, so uh, what they looked like. So you would have things like Donald the Fat or Joan the Lame and so on. And we see these in the annals of the Four Masters and so on. And that's a great source for you to go online through the UCC Celt databases and the annals online and so on. Now, the well-established names of clan names, such as the O'Neills and so on, were formed from some of these chieftains and clans at the time. But these names often had the subsumed Gallaghers, the O'Boyles and other names who traditionally descend from them. So they proliferate as we go on. Some sources say, and I got this from Donegal Ancestry, a site that's quite useful, that the growth of population, commercial travel, the single name system no longer was sufficient to enable a person to be identified. Others would argue with that and say that it was the breakdown of the kingship system into a warlord system where they were competing over territories in the 13th century and becoming petty lordships that controlled areas and so on. So there is a, a distinct pattern of surname and so on. Now, Irish surnames are very, very old, and we've got some wonderful sources for those. The MacLysets, Wolf, all on Ask About Ireland and other sources like that. And just to name some surnames common to Donegal, you have the Gallaghers, the Doherty's, the O'Donnells, the Boyles, the McLaughlin's, Sweeney's, Kelly's, McDade's, Freel, McGinley, McFadden, Campbell, Gillespie, Breslin, Boner, Brennan, McGowan, Ward, Galbraith, and some of these are not necessarily all Irish Catholic. They can be introduced from Scotland and so on because we have a big introduction of surnames with the Red Shanks and we did a show on that earlier on. And that's very little looked at and should be looked at an awful lot more. We also have surnames going from Donegal to Glasgow because of the nature of working and so on and what people are working with, which is cloth and the growth of the cloth and textile um, regions and so on. So these are really important as well. So I've been delighted to be working on the Mulherns and I had a wonderful visit with Dennis Mulhern in Triana weaving up there. They have the Irish house above in Donegal town and he was a mine of information. He was absolutely fantastic and that was a great help when you're doing a, a family reunion and, and undertaking that type of intricate detailed where you need to know where things are and what has happened and the name it's and changes of place names and so on so people on the ground in ireland are the mine of information not the encyclopedias and you might think it's the archives to a certain extent it is but you have to know the lay of the land so if you are doing any type of work like that please do pick up the phone please do visit the area 
and so on. Don't presume that you can do everything just through looking through a, a series of papers and so on, especially in areas where people might not know you and might feel um, slightly threatened if they see somebody whipping out a laptop to take down all details. They might wonder what that is about, as any of us would. So my recommendation as a family historian and genealogist is to have the respect for the people that you're trying to, to link up to and trying to make the connections with and to take the time and pay the visits and make the phone calls and so on and find out all, and it's all about give and take as well. It's all about if you find information then that's useful to their side of the family, making sure that you're, you're sharing that information and so on. Now, when going for citizenship and you're trying to prove your common great grandfather, it's not enough just to be talking about, uh, well, I think that's where they're from and yeah, they told me they were from Cork and plucking a Mary Collins or a Mary Donovan out of the sky and going that's fine now that that'll do it I can get a civil birth for that because that may not be the person you're looking for it all has to be verified and civil births in Ireland start in 1864 unfortunately not everybody is registered and that can pose a problem as well you know they exist you know they're accurate and so on but in 1864, the civil birth records would feature things like the name, the date of birth, the address, the parish and the district, and the gender, the county, the denomination, so on. And this is very useful because you can suddenly see how they're named as well. And how they're named is very important when you're looking on further records. So you know, for example, that Bridget may be in this case, was reduced down to Biddy Campbell, and then we found her on other sources of the petty court sessions and bits and pieces where she was fighting to hold on to lands in a very difficult time where people are trying to um, recover from the famine, and it has not been an easy process, and it's very much about people trying to, to hold on to what they have. So, in relation to your grandfather, your grandfather needs to be born in Ireland and then you're entitled to get registered in the foreign birth register and you go through the consulate and there's a fee I think it's almost 300 um, dollars or euro to get that organized and you need to provide your proofs of civil births your own family tree presuming that proving that you're linked to these people so that involves their death records their marriage records so on and they may be in the country that they've emigrated to and so on. It's a very straightforward process once you realise you need to get your paperwork in order. But you have to be proving you can't have any anomalies or they'll be sending back the material and rightly so for you to send it again. There isn't any room for error here. Now in the Mulhern family history, and I'm really looking forward to going back to beautiful Donegal again. I believe they have a wonderful diaspora at the end of September, um, the last week in September, the, the one of the first weeks in October. And I'm dying to find out more all about that. That's such a great idea of connecting people to their paths and so on. And because the object, objective of that initiative is to bring people back to Donegal to explore the county and find out for themselves why it's such a great county to visit. It is a great county to visit. It's beautiful to relocate to, to grow up in, to be educated in, to work in, to invest in and to retire in. And that's pretty much what I'm about with rural um, advantage and, and making sure that everybody knows where we are in rural Ireland and forming my my research and so on is all about making the connection on the Atlantic corridors to be able to link to the diaspora and so on. Now, in relation to the Mulherns, we would have looked at civil. They produced a wonderful book themselves that um, John had spent 10 years working on this. And you can tell it is clean work. It is thorough work. It is referenced work and you know exactly where everything comes from. It doesn't have to be in a big fancy binder or anything like that to be very, very good and full of rigour and very easy to work with. From the beginning of a family history, I would have felt that this is the type of family history that any family would be proud to produce because it's got the most important thing in it, which is information. And it's got 
accurate information, so much so that he was able to obtain his citizenship and able to register his birth on the foreign register and so on. And so that's very easy as well. You're looking at mortuary notices where he would have James Mulhern, husband of the late Bridget Mulhern, Nee Campbell, relative and friends invited to the funeral Thursday at 7.30 and so on. And they settled in Philadelphia, in, in P Pennsylvania and so on. So that's really important. And th you find a lot of references where Philly would be Philadelphia and so on. So in in years to come, they'll be trying to work out what's Philly. Because the nicknames and place names of how we call things change over time. And that's how people do things. So the surnames researched were the McGrenras, Dailies, Dealies and marriage records. So you need, if you've got an interest in this Please come along on the 24th of May to, to Harkins and uh, discover your relatives and your cousins and your bits and pieces because this is really important to us that we make the connections out there. And it'll, it, there's food and there's music and so on and, and, and we're really excited about it. Now, Griffith's valuation was used as a source for this. Um, ancestry, find my past, to great use and so on. It was very interesting because both the maternal and the paternal lines were tracked back. And the McGrenra line is as fascinating as the Mulhern line. It is very, very interesting indeed um, because of that link with going to Glasgow, working with Hannah Toner and so on. And there are some wonderful references um, through a wonderful program that was made, Hands it was called, and you can see how the factories were made. And I'm given to understand that uh, Mary McAleese would have had the carpets and Orison Uthron made from the carpets, from the wool that would be produced in that area, because she had worked in one of the factories sweeping the floor when she was a young girl. So that's the power of genealogy of bringing people back to space and place and really important to understand how you put it all together. Putting it all together always goes back to your staples of looking at your primary source material of the census records, 1901, 1911, your Griffiths valuation, which is a census substitute, your tithe allotments. And you can't beat the odd great book as well. And I would have to really say I couldn't put down Brendan McSivna's End of Outrage. It was fantastic. It's, I'm still reading it. It is to be recommended for anybody that's writing a family history on how to do it in a beautiful way, a wonderful writer and uh, a wonderful account of a very difficult time where we're talking about squaring of lands, emigration, the Molly Maguires, you know, and, and all these type of things that were happening at the time. Things we can't judge history on what we think it should be now and divorce it from what happened then. It just simply does not work like that um, it, it can't really fabricate the past like that so all your family histories and so on and how you how you look at the the various different things are are wonderful as well and maps of graveyards bits and pieces and and how we have the cousins linking everything we also have the McCanns in this but what they have also done as well is a beautiful family tree where it just looked absolutely stunning on how to do they had the family tree but when they had the grouping of the family names they have the family names in bold and separating out the different branches so you can see the names like Branson Sh Shelvin Doherty spelt D-O-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y because that changes in how it's spelt and so on. And we have the Toner, the Hughes, the Littles, the, the Dailies, the, the Ammons, the Muldoons, the Kavanaghs, the Timonies, the Rogers, the Kellys, the Regans, the McNallys, the McCaffertys, the Kearns, Campbells, McNulty's, McDermott's, Deary's, Layman's, McGrenra's, just a terrific terrific piece of work altogether and fascinatingly done and beautifully put together it's been my pleasure to work on this and to see 
their lovely table of contents, which is very clear. You can see the valuation of tenements. You can see this on the National Archives of Ireland, where you can go through the valuation books. They're freely available online. The foreign birth entry book, citizenship, the civil marriage records, which are going to be different to the baptismal registers in Donegal. Unfortunately, not many of them survive uh, prior to the 1860s. So many people have said it, it, it is a difficult space. My answer to that is to go through the death records on irishgenealogy.ie and to piece it together painstakingly when you're updating your family trees. There's nothing like a bit of hard work when you're going through this. And then you're more dependent on space and place and you must know your townlands. And you must also go, maybe if you can never come to Ireland, go through your Google Maps and find out the lie of the land. So... Absolutely fantastic. Occupation is really, really important. If you have weavers in the family, you realise that weaving is passed on. Dennis Mulhern, who I met, is the fifth generation of weaving. So the legacy of that, the intricacies and the strategies of how they're able to develop their cloth is second to none. You can't buy that type of expertise. You, you only pass it on because that's what family traditions do. And indeed, we'll be doing a good few shows on that and so on. So the foreign entry birth, once you've discovered your grandfather was born in Ireland and you just need one grandparent born in Ireland and you go through the consular office and so on and it could be the consular office of new york or there's consular offices all over the world and you get a number you get the date of entry the names in full and so on and that's what it means and unfortunately if you don't do it but when you have your grandfather born in ireland there's a difficulty in getting the birth registered it has to be from anyone belonging to you it has to be from the time you were registered so children born prior to the time you were registered, it doesn't work for them. So it, it is something that's well worth investigating and looking into. And um, you don't have to cede your other citizenship in relation to that. Now, as I say, we have a lot going on for the month of May. And the end of May will be the Mulhern family reunion. And... Just because it's one name doesn't mean it doesn't link to several other South Donegal names that we're all talking about. Please do contact me, Lorna Maloney, irishroots at plansandsurnames.com if you want to find any more information out about this or if you want any tips or clues on how to go about researching your family history. I look forward to um, helping you as all the genealogy radio sh shows are designed to do and next week we'll be looking at a number of different themes where we're looking at medical uh, reasons for death in the 19th century the names that are used for that the, the common cause of death bits and pieces and all those relate to family histories as well now the Donegal ancestry site there was some very very useful ones that I found very useful indeed and the information can't be copied but it can be can be referenced if, if, if you know what I mean so it's it, it was very very useful indeed so you have Donegal roots and so on and bits and pieces I found Roots Ireland very very useful during the cause this that is a subscription based site it's well worth it I have to say um I've, I found it to be to be extremely easy to go through the records and bits and pieces and, and I really liked it and they have Donegal genealogy of resources which consists of 3,000 pages a compilation of 18th to early 20th century and this is really good this is donation uh, website so you can donate some money to support that it's really worth it and i will be donating you've got births deaths marriages and you've, it's called donegalgenealogy.com and it's got births deaths marriages and wills census records commercial directories convicts donegal families famine and famine relief headstone inscriptions newspaper extracts archive and library resources um evictions diaspora family gatherings parish projects all the parishes broken up 
and even the naming pattern of that and it's updated as late as 18th of March 2019. All records in the website are in the public domain and should be free of copyright. Um, it's But copying and selling any of the records it, for your own profit is expressly forbidden. And th and that's fair enough. You're not allowed to do that because these people, this is for everybody. This is a site for everybody as such. So it's not uh, something that that would be fair. You, you must give credit where credit is due. So that's all for today. And thank you very much for listening. And also, I'll have news of our online school that I'm running with UCC this year in September. And that's the 22nd to the 26th. You might want to go up to the Donegal diaspora after that for a few days. And thanks for listening. <laughs>